Praise the Lord and Shalom everyone. Welcome to our uh, weekly uh, mentoring session. Uh, so glad and happy to have all of you join in this mentoring session this morning. Uh, before we begin, I'll ask uh, one of our students to please lead us in prayer. Anyone of you can please uh, unmute your mics and please lead us in a word of prayer before we begin this mentoring session. Can I ask uh, Daniel Oliver to lead us in prayer, please? Daniel? Daniel, are you there? Anyone can uh, lead us in prayer? You can unmute your mic and please lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Sam? Sam. Okay, thank you, Deepa Kedwil. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, Lord, that we can gather in your awesome presence, loving Father. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have, that we can come into your presence, loving Father, boldly, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray, Father God, even as we do this mentoring session, Father, that it will be useful to each and every person who attends its loving Father. We pray, Father, for your presence to manifest among us, Lord, and that Jesus will be glorified in everything that we do, everything that we learn today, loving Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deepa Ketwin. Uh, this morning, um, uh, Jean George will talk to us or share with us about mental health. And uh, we'll, after her, her sharing, her talk. Uh, we will take up any questions that you have on mental health. Uh, over to uh, Jean George. Good morning and thank you, Pastor Selena. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, we're going to be discussing a little bit about mental health today. Uh, mental health is a very, very broad topic, but nevertheless, I'll try my best to cover the important uh, points. Um, I just uh, uh, taken good mental health as uh, today's topic and uh, in the next couple of minutes we'll just uh, go through what could be what are some predictors of good mental health or you know what are some things that we could take care of to be able to ensure that we have uh, a good and a, a healthy mental health I, I'll just take a minute to just share my screen uh, just bear with me Okay, I hope this is, uh, this is, everyone can see this. Yeah, okay, right. So um, uh, let's, just, uh, let's just start off with first and foremost, understanding what uh, good mental health is and why is it that we really need to focus on that. So good mental health is crucial for our overall well-being. And um, it's uh, uh, it, and it's good mental health that helps us to lead a full, active, and a meaningful life. So, uh, having good mental health is just not merely the absence of some mental health condition or mental health disorders. Instead, it uh, it adds to it or it encompasses a lot of factors, which is what we will look over in a few minutes. So when we look at scripture and the Bible, the Bible does give us principles and insights of the holistic nature of us as humans and how a lot of aspects um, in our uh, living or in our, um, in our existence uh, really influences our mental health and, and how it influences one another. And I just want to bring about a familiar scripture to you all. Uh, which is in, found in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and this is what it reads. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So through this uh, scripture verse, we see that God desires to make us whole, 
to make us sanctified and holy, not just in our spirit being, but entirely. It's in our body, in our spirit and soul, so that we will be sound and blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. So I'd like to focus today on a broad overview of what aspects and predictors um, are of good mental mental health. And I think around 10 or 11 points that I just want to quickly take you through so that um, we can, you know, we can ensure not just for ourselves, but also for those we meet that um, some of these aspects are taken care of. So the first and foremost one, as um, as we as we uh, you know as as we all understand, is um, is physical well-being. Now uh, that's the most basic part of our well-being is our physical health. So our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we need to take care of it by following regular practices. So it can be regular exercise, a balanced diet making sure that we have enough of sleep, um, making sure that, that we take care of uh, not um, uh, harming our bodies, avoiding those harmful habits, whether it be excessive food, whether it be um, any other practices that would harm our physical body. So the first one for a good predictor of mental health is um, our physical well-being. The second one is emotional well-being. And emotional well-being is the ability or emotional awareness is the ability to manage and regulate our own emotions. So being aware of how we feel and finding ways to deal with our strong emotions predicts good mental health. So it is important for us to, first of all, be aware of what we are experiencing emotionally and learning how to manage our emotions, which means how do we express our emotions and how do we regulate our emotions? So when we are in an emotional concern or an emotional overwhelm, how do we learn to regulate that? So that's uh, another predictor of mental health. The third one that we look at is social connectedness. Now, social connectedness is the ability of us for us to build and maintain meaningful relationships with others. And while we do that, we experience a sense of belonging. Now, this can be with our families. This can be in our marriages, with our children, with our friends, with a community of believers, with the place that you work in. So that's that. it's that ability to have healthy relationships where you're able to connect to one another and build yourself up. The fourth one is the sense of identity and purpose. Now, knowing what one's purpose and what one's identity is really gives life meaning and a sense of direction, and it is known to positively affect mental health. So our identity and purpose can also have a bearing on the way that we see ourselves, on our self-image and on our self-worth. So where we pin our identity really um, uh, predicts also how how we we how our well-being is so to ensure that our sense of identity and purpose is in the right place and us for us as believers we know that it it comes from a deep relationship with Jesus knowing who we are in Jesus the uh, the fifth one is early life experiences when um, there are good and healthy early life experiences or childhood experiences uh, where there is a nurturing or a supportive or a stable uh, childhood. That can be a very good foundation for mental health. So having those positive and nurturing early family relationships actually goes a long way in individuals feeling nurtured, in individuals having a more stable outlook to life. The next one is um, the ability to cope with stress. So having good coping strategies, such as learning how to solve problems, finding support during time of difficulties, engaging in disciplines, in spiritual disciplines, some of these are protective factors. So whenever some uh, people have, we have struggles of how we learn to cope with those struggles really is a measure for good mental health. Uh, the seventh one is uh, thinking patterns. Now we see, we read it over and over in the Bible 
of how it talks about the renewed mind. So a lot takes place when our thoughts are not aligned to truth. So if there are negative and pessimistic thoughts, this can often lead to significant emotional problems. So focusing on channelizing our thoughts by the lens of the word of God can really help us navigate through hardships, through struggles, through difficulties we may face. So to to really look at how we think, what what are what is our self talk, what are the kind of thoughts that we keep engaging in over and over is again a very important factor. The eighth one is building intellectual capacities. So a mind that is really set on learning and growing and developing personally um, is a very important factor in mental health. So a mind that's curious to learn, to understand, whatever the area of interest may be. So that can be by where you're seeking out new experiences to learn, building on your knowledge, building on your skills. All of this ensures one has an active mind. So even when you're engaging in activities like your hobbies or other passions, it's something that can bring you a lot of joy and, and follow through into your purpose. Uh, the ninth one is spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline is that which builds your intimacy with God. And that is a way to build faith, to be able to seek wisdom, to find comfort and strength. So godly values can provide you know, a moral framework that can guide one's behavior and decisions. So when we live in alignment with these values, it can lead us to that sense of peace. And the 10th and the 11th one is an absence of chronic medical conditions. So if there are conditions uh, that causes chronic pain or other long time, long term influences, it is known to have a bearing on one's mental health and it can be a risk uh, factor for mental health issues. And the 11th one is abstaining from substances or addictive behaviors such as drugs, alcohol, other forms of addictive behaviors such as pornography, sexual addictions, unhealthy use of gadgets. All of this can prevent associated mental health problems. So it's essential for us to understand that our mental health can fluctuate throughout our lives. Um, there will be times of good mental health, but there will also be times of struggle or illness. Now, recognizing this and knowing when and how to seek support, whether for yourself or someone else, is crucial. So it's worth noting that the Bible provides spiritual and moral guidance, offers principles that can be beneficial for our mental health. For specific mental health issues, it is always advisable to seek appropriate medical or even counseling care while you wait on the Lord for healing and wholeness. Uh, that wraps up in short um, uh, on good mental health. I'll be open for any questions you'd have. Over to you, Pastor Selena. Thank you very much, Jean, for giving us a broad overview of good mental health in just a, a few minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will take up any questions. Any of you have any questions regarding mental health? Anything that Jean has uh, shared, uh, the 11 uh, points that she has presented? Uh, or if you have any other questions regarding mental health, please feel uh, free to uh, unmute your mics and ask your questions, or you can even post your questions in the chat section. Or if you have any doubts or you want to know anything more, uh, you can feel free to unmute your mics and ask, and uh, or you can even post your doubts, your queries, uh, your questions uh, on in the chat section, and Jean will help us uh, answer them. Uh, Jean, can you continue to pre uh, uh, present that uh, 11 points that sure. you... Sure, sure, I'll do that. Thank you. Anyone has any questions? On mental health, anything? Any doubts? Okay, Daniel Oliver, thank you for your question. Uh, Daniel Oliver's question is, how can we overcome stress? 
Okay, thank you, Daniel, for that question. Um, so uh, I think first we need to just understand what stress is. Stress is is a physical react, physical and emotional, cognitive reaction towards something that's going wrong. So our bodies also have a stress mechanism. So every time you're going through stress, your body responds, and that's what we call a stress. Uh, it is important to identify what are some uh, symptoms of stress. You would find physical symptoms of stress. You would find emotional symptoms of stress. You would find uh, um, intellectual symptoms of stress. Now, all of this is um, it, it actually helps you to stabilize and build yourself back into some kind of an equilibrium. So first and foremost, it is to understand that stress is normal, that we all have stress, but to identify the sources of stress is the first and foremost point. How do you identify the source of stress? To really check with yourself, what, what would you be going through at that point of time that's causing you that issue of stress? Now, once you've identified it, it is to, it is to understand how is it that you can deal with that stress. Now, if it's, let's say, if it's, um, if it's financial stress or, or if, it's, if it's stress maybe at your workplace, really identifying that and finding a way as to how to minimize some of that some of that stress so some um, uh, commonly that we, you know uh, one of the issues that we find in stress is not being able to have a good balance to manage many things together maybe it's home it's work it's ministry how do you manage all of this together so first and foremost is to be able to um, um, you know, kind of put down what your priority is and look at what are some controllables, what are some things that you can handle, you can control to help uh, work out and what are some things that are uncontrollable. Like, for example, control, controlling uh, your situation could be maybe at your workplace, it's probably just getting to work on time and being able to schedule um, you know, a, a list of things that you need to, that's a controllable, that's something that you, ca that you can do. What is it uncontrollable? Maybe it's the things that others think about you. It's not, a, it's not a controllable, it's not something that you can do about. And you learn to find a way to uh, work through that. So prior, first I did mention was to identify, and then it is to be aware that you're in stress, to identify the source of your stress. Third is to kind of make a list to find out what is what are things you can control, what are things that you can't control, and ensuring that you that you work through that. There are a lot more of points, but I'm just keeping it to a gist of these three. Thank you very much, uh, Jean George. Uh, Daniel, did that help answer your question? How we can overcome stress? Uh, so Daniel's uh, other question is, can we handle our own stress individually to overcome it? Uh, yes, absolutely, Daniel, you can do that. And I think that's something that uh, uh, even, even, through our, um, uh, even through our spiritual walk with God, that's one thing that, that we learn to do, to be able to build our faith, to be able to uh, speak our faith, to overcome whatever we are going through, through the word, through practices, through ensuring that we, we get the support of others. Uh, and also some practical guidelines of really, um, uh, you know, counting, counting what is the cost that a certain situation may have towards your health. Like, like I said, you know, if it's a workplace and if, if there are many things that you're doing or if there are multiple things that you're doing, how do you count the cost? How do you really look to see what is your priority and working towards that? So, yes, it is absolutely possible to do that. And some of these predictors I spoke about really help in dealing with, with stress as well. Thank you, Jean. Uh, did that help, uh, Daniel? Okay. Uh, we'll go on to the next question uh, it's from Lucy Sanlu. Uh, she says, how can we help guide, speak to others from abstaining themselves from gadgets? Okay, this again is, a, is an extremely broad topic, but I'll just probably put one or two points. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is, I think, first and foremost is to whenever you're getting into a conversation about anything that you're trying to help someone abstain, 
it's always good to have them think about your question rather than giving them maybe 10, 12 points about why they shouldn't be doing that. So a good approach is to, uh, to probably put out a question like, you know, what, how, how does your gadget help you? Or what does it do for you? Or what does it not do for you? You know, when you do ask uh, questions that help people think, they come to a point of understanding or they come to a point of being more aware, right? That's one way that you can help is to pose a question so that they are in that brainstorming process with you rather than you bringing about a list of 10 points as to why or uh, they shouldn't be involved in something. So always engaging them in a conversation. That's the first one. The second one is often a reading material that can help testimonies that can help of how stories of um, people maybe in gadget addiction what what it does or uh, you know some kind of material that works uh, or that that helps with understanding what an addiction can can do to someone is something that helps and uh, and often you would find that people are into some addiction because uh, not often, okay, it's, it's just not the the only rule, but often you will find people in addiction because uh, it, it's a part of their coping, um, either because of boredom. That's when they probably uh, use a lot of a lot of gadgets, or there isn't a sense of purpose that they have, or they are they do not have an organized uh, schedule for a day, and that's what kind of gets them into addictive behaviors. So getting people involved in something, keeping them occupied in, in either some work or something that engages them, often you'll find that a lot of addictions actually loses its power, right? Because it becomes a coping either for boredom or for depression or for, or for, a, or for a lack of stimulation. These are some of the reasons why this. So getting them involved in something really kind of helps. So I've just said three uh, broad points again. I hope that that helps. Thank you, Jean. That was very helpful. I think this is a concern for most parents and those working with teens and uh, children. I think it's important that, uh, you know, one way we can help them is uh, give them alternate uh, activities that are engaging, engaging their mind, their body, that can tire them that, you know, they would not be willing to go back and uh, uh, look at their gadgets. And also, like Jean said, you know, have a schedule. Uh, so when when they have a schedule that they follow, then uh, uh, the whole day is packed and they won't have time for uh, uh, gadgets. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. I hope that answered your question. Yes, uh, we'll go on to our next question from Sanjay. He says, as a believer, how do we reach out to friends or loved ones with mental health issues who aren't believers? I tried inviting a friend to church or a Christian retreat, but they declined my offer. Okay, thank you, Sanjay, for that question. Yeah, so um, reaching out to people uh, who, are, who are having mental health concerns, uh, needs to be done with a lot of empathy and compassion. So uh, the first and foremost thing that someone with a mental health concern may need is a connection, is a relationship, um, like, like any other thing. So uh, one of the best ways to do that is being available for people who are having significant mental health issues. Often those with mental health issues, especially those with depression and uh, anxiety, th those kind of disorders feel very alone, feel very isolated. So just building that connection um, on a regular basis really helps them see that they are cared for, that they are, um, that they are loved, that they are accepted, right? And so as you build that relationship with them, uh, I think that one of the next things, the most powerful things that we have um, in our toolkit is prayer. To be able to just spend some time and you know ask people if they are okay that you pray with them. And often 
uh, a, a lot of times, I've, I, I've seen it in my own personal experiences that a lot of people are more than willing to have somebody just speak over their lives and just pray for them, because that in itself can open the power of the spirit to work in their lives. So one is building a connection. Secondly, is prayer. Third is um, uh, 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 encouraging them to get support and help from a professional, especially if it's something that you feel you're not able to handle on your own. It is good to uh, to take that effort to uh, get them support. So it may be just calling up a counselor or uh, you know uh, engaging with a with a with a psychiatrist who can actually get some some kind of support for them. That is actually really really helpful. And in time, as you build that relationship with them. Is something that you can do is to you know open up uh, them coming to a meeting, to a to a Bible study, or to or to a church service. Uh, through a relationship is what is how you can bring people into into church, right? So that that is true even with mental health. So I I I trust that you know some of these things are things we can just keep in mind as we are approaching people with mental health issues. Thank you again, Jean and uh, Sanjay. Hope that uh, uh, helped. That helps, Sanjay. Okay, we'll uh, wait to hear from. Okay, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, for uh, your query. Uh, we'll move on to. Uh, Susie Binu, she says, is it possible for someone to feel low without any underlining reason? I have come across young people who feel very low on certain days for no apparent reason. Okay. Yes, uh, Susie. Yes, it is true that people can feel low without any underlying reason. Um, so uh, often, uh, you know, when we look at mental health, uh, I'm just going to give you an analogy. Look at it like an onion, right? And uh, when you're looking at mental health issues, uh, before you get to the core, you have to peel out those uh, uh, those that are outside, the skin that's outside. You know, you peel it out little by little before you get to the core. So uh, one of the things that we do is. Uh, when someone does come in with uh, any kind of mental health concerns, the first and foremost thing that we do is to ensure, uh, to, to check to see if there are any physical contributing factors. So certain certain physical conditions can cause a low mood, like some of the examples are um, an inactive thyroid can cause depression or vitamin D deficiency can cause depression. So that's the first thing that you would assess for. And when you go to a doctor, that's the first thing they will do. They will ask you to do a couple of blood tests to actually check to see if there is any physical contribution to it. All right. So moving past that, you move into the emotional realm. Then you move into the uh, to the uh, to the thought patterns, to the to to how a person thinks. Then you move into the volitional part, their will. What are the things or the behavioral part? What are the things that they do? And the last is what we do is the spiritual uh, the core of it is the spiritual uh, being of them. So anyone who comes to you, this is a progression of how we would move into the more deeper things. So it is true that people can feel very low um, for no apparent reason. Now, remember that feeling low and de and having depression are two different things. We all can experience the time of feeling low. Something happened. Someone said something to us. Something didn't go well. You may experience a one or two day of feeling low or you know uh, just feeling in uh, feeling uh, those morning blues all of that can happen and that's the normal um, uh, normal pattern because we are emotional beings we do experience the world from our emotions so yes it is a normal thing however how we deal with those um, with those smaller periods of low or, or mood um, uh, mood lows is definitely important you know, and some of these practices is is something that helps us to overcome uh, those low moods or those uh, periods of uh, mild depression or distress that we may be feeling. I hope that helps. I hope that uh, helps, Susie. 
uh, gene can we also say hormonal uh, cycles like the monthly cycles can also just yes. uh, bring about uh, yeah. a low in uh, the girls and the women yes, yes that is the thank physical you, part of it as well yes yes okay. thank you jean uh, susie i hope that answered yes she says thank you so much uh, we'll move on to the next question, uh, Jack and Joel. Um, as we have uh, fluctuating mental health, sometimes we ourselves are going through our lows. Is it okay for us to stay away from ministry so that we are uh, in uh, away from ministry that we are involved in on a temporary basis? For example, when people call you for prayer over phone, is it okay to tell, shall I call you after a week or do we direct them to some other person who can help them? Uh, they might be going through tough times as well, just like us. Okay, uh, maybe I'll, I'll uh, put this out to the other pastors also, but then I'll just probably yes. share, share one or two things. Uh, is that, yes, it is true. Um, we as ministers, people who are also working for the Lord can experience uh, all of this, all of what uh, Jack and Jack and all, all of what Jack and spoke about, just that feeling of low or just feeling a sense of stress. And uh, in my experience, I think it is absolutely uh, honest and uh, integral on your part to, to be able to share that you may not be able to respond or, um, uh, or you know, call them at this point of time and it would be okay to give ask them to give you some time before you can call them back and um, personally I think that's a, that's a healthy th thing to do because um, often yes you may need to take care of yourself go um, go in the presence of the Lord to be able to gain strength to to be able to gain peace before you can actually minister from there so um, in my opinion I think it is it is okay but I'd like to leave it to the rest of the team if they'd like have any other thoughts. Thank you, Jean. Uh, any of other faculty would like to help Jack in with her questions? Um, just share um, my thoughts there. Uh, and I agree with Jean that you know, as ministers, we are also earthen vessels. We are also human. And uh, we do face our, you know, our set of emotional challenges as well. Uh, but I just want to qualify, you know, the fact is that as leaders, um, we need to develop or we should have the ability to maintain ourselves strong, stronger than the people we are serving. Uh, which means, I mean, I, and I think of a classic example of David and his men, you know, after Ziklag. This is a First Samuel, I think the last chapter is 23, I think, um, where his entire team was down, but David had to encourage himself in God so that he could, you know, hear from God and lead the team. That means, uh, you know, you can imagine more than 500 people around you are all depressed, upset, discouraged, uh, and they're even thinking of stoning you. And in the midst of it, you have, you have to hold yourself up emotionally also be in a position to hear from God and lead the team for lead the you know lead the, the people forward. So I think that's a basic requirement of somebody in Christian leadership, Christian ministry. That is, we need to be in a place to do that, and we will have to do that very often. Uh, so while you know we must take time to rest, uh, it is perfectly okay to tell somebody that you know uh, uh, sorry I, I, I will call back. I will you know I'll get back to you after a few days, all of that is perfectly okay. But uh, we have to be careful that we don't make that a habit. If you make that a habit, then we've got a problem. That means we need to move ourselves out of that place of leadership, go get help, recover, and then come back to our place of leadership. Otherwise, it's gonna be detrimental uh, for everybody else who are following us. You, know, you can't have a wounded leader uh, like Jesus said, the blind leading the blind. You can't have a wounded leader leading an army. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, so I just want to qualify that. As leaders, it's, it is important to develop the skill to be strong all the time. Uh, we understand that, that we are human. We need to take time off. We need to balance it. But we also need to recognize when we need to get ourselves out of our position of leadership, when we, we ourselves need some serious help. And we need to be uh, 
you know, cognizant of that. We need to be willing to step out of that place of leadership and say, hey, I need six months to go through therapy. I need a year of healing. Uh, and, and, and therefore, I will not be leading during that time. You know, that's holding ourselves accountable for the benefit of the people. Uh, we need to be able to do that. And there's nothing wrong with doing these things. And just my thoughts, I'll leave it open to the others, please. Thank you, Pastor, uh, for sharing. Yes, uh, I hope that answered your question, uh, Jack. And anyone else would like to share on Jack's questions? Or we can move on to the next question. OK, we'll move on to the next question from Zelatoli Watsa. How to deal with people who are in a denial mode that they need help with their addiction? Uh, so I, I'll take up that question partly. So uh, denial often is um, a way for people to deal with situations that are anxiety provoking and even also in addiction. So it it's a, it's a coping mechanism um, where they uh, they are in a position where they, they do not face their fears or face their issues in a healthy or a productive way. Um, so if it is something that's causing problems, if denial is causing problems or preventing them, preventing a person from dealing with a condition like ad addiction, um, it's important uh, you know, to keep engaging someone like that in conversation. So let's suppose if someone you love is in denial about a problem, uh, it is to focus more on being supportive instead of um, instead of a forceful um, uh, push. Nevertheless, uh, but I think when, when we are being supportive, you're being willing to listen and offering to help them as much as possible to get that support. But um, in especially in addictive behaviors, um, we, we have seen that a lot of people who are in denial uh, often wait for some kind of a crisis in order to turn for help. And uh, maybe at, at certain points of time, you know, there's such a huge wall that's built that they refuse to take that kind of a support. So for, for, for you who is a family member or who is a um, well-wisher, it is to keep that, uh, that, that open conversation with them so that you are, uh, you are showing that interest in helping them get the help that they need. Again, going back to some of the points that I spoke about earlier, a lot of times people in addiction do not know what are some of the pitfalls and uh, pitfalls of addiction? What happens to them as a result of an overuse or an abuse of a certain substance? So just educating them about them about that sometimes can break those uh, uh, those denial patterns. Um, and of course, uh, you know the the biggest part of being able to minister to them in love and continuing to uphold them in prayer so that. You know, they, they come to a point where they are able to get that support for themselves is essential. Thank you, uh, Jean. Uh, yes, I think uh, those points are very valid. Uh, thank you. I think it's important that we show them love and care. Uh, also come across as being non-judgmental. And I think uh, often uh, addictions can arise because of underlining uh, issues that they have that, uh, you know, some people feel that they're not loved, cared for, they're not able to handle stress. It can be peer pressure. Um, it can be a whole lot of other things. So we need to get down to the root of what is really, uh, you know, getting them into this addictive behavior and uh, address those uh, concerns, those issues that they may have and help them out. And then as Jean also said, you know, help them to see uh, uh, the harmful effects of uh, what they are into, what they're engaging in, uh, so that they are aware and, uh, you know, that they can uh, be helped in making the right decision. I hope that uh, helped Zelatoli. Thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean, again, for answering uh, Zelly's question. Uh, oh, our next question is from Daniel Oliver. He says, how can we help a person to overcome depression? 
uh, uh, because a depressed person can't do anything on his own, no matter whatever suggestions we give them. They aren't in a mood or in a position to follow them. So as a caring person, what can be done and how uh, it can be done to help them overcome depression? Over to you, Jean. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel, for that question. Yes, someone who has depression, or as we call it, as clinical depression, like I did mention, is very different from someone who experiences uh, smaller periods of low. So when we say someone's in depression, if we look at it clinically, we are saying that someone who has a low mood for over two weeks, you will find that they are lethargic. They are, they are not able to do uh, anything that, uh, you know, either their, their work or uh, things, their responsibilities. They feel a sense of fatigue. There are significant negative thoughts. Um, uh, severe depression is when uh, these two, if, there are, if there's a presence of these two symptoms, that's um, uh, uh, death wishes, uh, a desire to, to just die, and of course, suicidal intentions or ideations. Now, this is when we do call someone having clinical depression. So when, if you have experienced someone going through this, um, it is first and foremost important to get them support and help. So this means uh, ensuring that they get that medical assistance because um, the people under severe depression, um, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, may not be able to snap out of it just like that. So it is important to show care, to show concern, to show empathy, and being able to help them get the right kind of support and help, whether it is meeting a medical psychiatrist or getting the help of a counselor who's able to support and help them. So that's that's in, that's a first hand, especially if you do see um, symptoms of uh, suicidal ideations or probable attempts in the past it is a uh, it is it's not something that you can take lightly it's something that needs to be taken seriously uh, getting the support of probably uh, immediate uh, family members or or uh, some support system so that there can be close monitoring as well as ensuring that they get that medical assistance. Now, through this process or as they are doing this process is continuing to encourage them and strengthen them in the word to bringing back um, uh, scripture back to them. And uh, if, if you, you actually look at the repository of the of the sermons, there are sermons on how to deal with depression, how to deal with anxiety through the word. So just um, uh, once they have got that medical assistance and help, uh, bringing them to that place of strengthening them through the word and encouraging them by prayer and, and physical and emotional support is something that, that can, can be caring. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, Daniel, did that help answer your uh, query? Uh, can you give us the Bible quotes which you're referring to? Um, I think. Yes, Jean, do you want to these say something? These are available. Uh, yeah, I think these are available on the APC website. There are sermons that's there on dealing with depression and uh, uh, anxiety, where you will have, there are a whole lot of uh, um, uh, references that are there. I think pastors also just put up a, a, put up a link where you could find that. Yes. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, uh, Pastor. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Lucy's uh, question. Uh, how can we comfort, strengthen people with scriptures for being neglected or for not being paid attention by people? So I open this question up to our other faculty. Anyone would like to answer this uh, question, Lucy's question? Thank you, Lucy, for your question. How can we comfort, strengthen people with scriptures for being neglected or for not being paid attention by people? Can other faculty please help in answering this Question, please. Smita, you like to share? Smita. 
Smita Naruna, are you there? Um, just a quick thought uh, here. Um, so uh, I just want just two things actually. One is um, uh, we can share scriptures on how much God loves us, the fact that He is mindful of us, and um, and the fact that um, you know He is um, He's come to you know the Holy Spirit. He He lives in us, and um, He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Now that's a big thing, you know, to know that we are loved by the God of heaven and earth. Um, that he knows us, that he understands us, that he is with us. Um, now that's a, that's a very uh, comforting, uh, encouraging truth. And uh, when a person gets a revelation of that, that they are never alone, and that will drive out, you know, all anxiety and fear. Like scripture says, perfect love drives out all fear. Right. So that's uh, that's the first thing I would say um, to turn people to the Father's love, God's love. Um, the second one is um, how God sees us. That is our uh, identity. And how how does God see us? To really see us, see ourselves, the way He sees us. What thoughts that He does He have uh, about us when He sees us as new creations? Um, yeah, so, uh, and again, you know, Scripture gives us <clears throat> uh, when, because the Bible is full of His thoughts uh, about us. And about various things and also about us. So when we when we share those scriptures in Christ, scriptures, what we have become in Christ, who we are in Christ. Um, now these are realities, right? And the Holy Spirit will, uh, when we share those scriptures, the Holy Spirit will uh, uh, bear witness uh, with the person's heart and make it a uh, you know um, bring much strength and comfort. Yeah. Uh, anyone else can also add to this, please. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Jay Kumar Isaiah. Anyone else would like to add or help Lucy? Uh, yes. Uh, so I'd just like to add uh, uh, one more thing that we can do is really help them to understand their identity in Christ. Uh, so yes, there will be people who will put us down or say things, but uh, really help them and to understand their identity in Christ. Ephesians 1. Chapter 1, 2, and 3 talks about it, that we are seated with him, we are blessed with every blessing, and uh, uh, we are God's children. And so when we, you know, we can encourage them to read these scriptures, stand on that identity. Yes, in the natural, we may be facing neglect, rejection, ridicule, um, but in the spiritual, we are seated with him in heavenly places. We are God's children. So uh, probably these uh, scriptures can help and encourage them. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul Emmanuel. Uh, also, basically, get the person to just see, you know, uh, how God looks at them, how God values them, how precious uh, they are, uh, you know, his thoughts towards them. And I think there are uh, numerous scripture passages that basically, you know, when you look at it, uh, you know, God's thoughts towards us, what he thinks about us, uh, where he has placed us, uh, his love for us, um, you know, how he values us and how precious we are thing is so beautiful and uh, will really encourage them and strengthen them and uh, build them. And also, Pastor Ashish has, uh, uh, you know, posted uh, Overcoming Negative Emotions, the message series, so you can help them uh, with that. Uh, we have um, just one more question uh, by Esther. Uh, uh, can we just help you with this question? Uh, suggest any Christian organization that can help uh, people in need regarding mental health. Jean, quickly, if you could just mention one or two, please, before we wind up. Sure. sure. Um, our very own Chrysalis Counseling, where we, where we do have, where we do offer counseling services uh, with, uh, with a biblical base, with a biblical perspective. Uh, there are other in the country. There's one in Hyderabad, which is called uh, Person to Person. Uh, there is one in Delhi that's called the BCTI. These are some of the, uh, there is there are a few in Chennai. I'm sorry, I'm not able to recollect those names, but uh, there are Christian organizations uh, if you do need, um, if, if at any point of time someone is in need in a specific state, I could give you some of those details. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Jean, for uh, sharing, for answering all the questions. Thank you all for uh, uh, for those of you who asked your questions, your queries, your doubts. Thank you for posting them. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for. Uh, uh, joining uh, the mentoring uh, session today, and Pasashis has also posted Crystal's counseling person to person and BCTI. Um, uh, we'll move on to our classes now. Uh, have a blessed day. We'll just pause for a quick word of prayer before we leave. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God. We thank you that um, you uh, desire that we live whole lives. You created us to live whole lives, Father. We just uh, consecrate our minds. We just declare that each one of us have the mind of Christ. We declare that we have sound understanding, sound uh, wisdom, uh, sound thoughts, thoughts that are pure, uh, holy. And God, we pray that uh, we would walk and function in the soundness of mind and the mind of Christ that you have given to us father we just bless this day for us uh, we just commit everything into your hands we just pray that this day will be blessed for us god we thank you we bless you in jesus name we pray amen thank you everyone have a blessed uh, day and see you for the next mentoring hour uh, next thursday thank you thank you ma'am thank you pankaj